I'm excited to invite Michael, invite Michael Shaheen. Um, me and Michael go way back. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but Michael is a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas, and he currently studies how glaciers respond to iceberg calving events. <laughs> hey! <laughs> and how iceberg launch impacts calving. Uh, Michael is almost on his way out with his PhD in his fifth year, graduating very soon. Um, so we'll hear a lot about what he's been doing within his dissertation work. So with that, let's welcome Michael. Awesome. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michaela, for the incredible, unforgettable introduction. And yeah, I will just go on about most of my dissertation work. Um, it's tentatively titled Where the Ice Ends, Calving and Ice Ocean Interactions at Helheim Glacier and Beyond. So right, uh, most of people in this role, pretty much everyone in this room knows that Greenland's just losing a lot of mass. Um, specifically, the Greenland ice sheet holds about 7.3 meters of sea level rise and is currently losing about 269 gigatons of ice per year. And this is um, data from NASA's GRACE satellite missions, which um, measure changes in, changes in Earth's gravitational field. And this mass loss signal can be partitioned into two components. One, um, surface mass balance. So this figure, well, this picture on the top, which accounts for about 34% of the mass loss. And this is, think about surface runoff, melting processes like that. And the rest, the 66%, um, is accounted for by ice dynamics, so think about speeding, thinning, grounding line retreat, grounding line just being the transition between grounding and floating ice, and iceberg calving, the mechanical detachment of ice itself. And um, But why do glaciers speed up like this um, figure here? Um, and that's a central question of my research, and there's currently a few competing hypotheses within the glaciology community, namely one, um, ocean driving change at the terminus, the terminus being where the glacier ends, and for marine terminating glaciers, ends into fjord waters, and two, um, surface runoff reaching the bed, which will, a lot of glaciologists argue, will lubricate the bed, bed increase sliding, therefore increase acceleration, thinning, and more mass loss. Um, and the reason why a lot of these, um, a lot of the glaciology communities still um, arguing about these two hypotheses is simply because we can't see uh, key processes. For example, here on the schematic on the left, we can't see the ice bed interface one because it's just underwater, and sometimes under um, what's called the ice melange, which is a um, a granular material with iceberg class and sea ice like matrix. And you also can't see the ice ocean interface where the um, ice in the ocean meet. And also a lot of these processes, for example, iceberg calving, they have smaller processes that can you know, happen instantaneously within minutes, such as like, you know, the melange pushing against the terminus and also has like, you know, long-term effects of glacier velocity because they can change on seasonal and annual timescales. So we simply just can't see it that great. Um, and also, maybe Kevin, one of Kevin's favorite figures here is from the, the recent Green et al. paper in 2024, where they just look at every variable they could get data a hold of. For example, on this confusion matrix, they have 13 variables, um, and they're trying to correlate um, seasonality, or what causes these seasonal swings in terminus position and ice velocity. And what the authors come up with is that the only, well, the most, um, the strongest correlation is that seasonal range and uh, mass change have about a R square of about um, or an R value of eight four, which you know compared to everything else isn't really you know that great, but it doesn't really show us a causal relationship. Why is is mass change because of the seasonality, or does seasonality change um, this mass loss signal? But that's why I want to shout out to um, Kevin's work because what they're doing I think is quite pioneering. Um, they look at um terminus um, position over time and predict it with um, a machine learning algorithm called XG boost, which is um, this black line, which is the predicted terminus position there. And then they can um, kind of look into the weeds of this signal and decompose it to look at um, which um, parameters using a SHAP um, analysis to look at which parameters actually influence this um, signal the most. So shout out to Kevin on that. Um, and beyond just, um, Beyond just um, the confusion of so many variables, we also have um, really confusing glaciers and Helheim Glacier in East Greenland, which is the main study site for my research, is um, particularly confusing. Um, from Twyla Moon's pioneering work in 2014, they um, look at 55 tidewater glaciers around the Greenland ice sheet, and Glacier 35 simply corresponds to Helheim Glacier here. And 
you can see that it has a different symbol each year and each symbol represents um, a, a type of um, velocity response that um, happens each year. So for example, the green triangles represent the terminus control. So think of more of the, the ocean hypothesis. The crosses represent the runoff control. So think of more of like if people are more prefer like bed processes and the downward slope is just um, a consistent slowdown and the upward slant is the consistent speed up. And in 2009, it just, we couldn't, they couldn't tease apart what dominant signal was. So they just simply put both. And to compound this confusion even more at Helheim Glacier, um, there's many new studies that came out um, that both, you know, very, both have different results, even using similar methods. For example, Sheng et al. in 2022 and Downs et al. in 2023, they both use the um, ice sheet sea level systems model, um, or ISSM for short. Um, and they come up with one terminus controlled and runoff controlled, but even for the same glacier, Helheim, but using the same model. And then for the observational studies, they both use very similar um, NASA velocity products. And they also come out with terminus and runoff controlled for different studies. And the main point I'm trying to make here is that um, even with the same models and very similar data, the results are still split. And this just highlights the competing hypotheses even more within the glaciology community. So right, there has to be something missing when everyone's arguing about um, terminus visit, well, terminus controlled versus runoff controlled. And for my research, um, we installed um, autonomous terrestrial laser scanners, also known as ATLAS. And these are um, TLSs, oh, whoops, wrong way. And they scan about 10 kilometer distances and we installed Atlas South in 2015. Well, I didn't, but, and then Atlas North in 2018. And they scan um, every six hours during non-winter months and once a day during the winter um, when operational. Because when you go to Greenland, it's really hard to maintain systems that just operate year round. And it's just can be quite a hassle to get things working, but it's kind of a miracle that we have so much data um, and we have, they take about 30 to 50 minutes each scan. And a lot of scientists, you know, always want all the data. So we have over 4,000 um, combined scans totaling at a combined about over 120 billion points. And this just becomes such um, a data reduction problem. And then I start getting into my research and appreciating data management. So if anyone has to do with ridiculously large amounts of data, I yeah, would love to talk to see um, how y'all approach these problems. Um, to look at specifically what the Atlas systems look like, we have the laser scanner out in the front. We have two solar panels here, about six um, panels on each tower, um, an automated weather station, um, the control box where we can plug into our laptop and um, the, look at the systems um, conditions, and also methanol fuel cells for um, winter operations. Because these can scan during the um, the winter months in Greenland when it's completely dark because we they use them um, a 1064 nanometer wavelength, so infrared wavelength, which is not eye safe. So when you go there, please wear proper eye protection. Um, so because we have such a unique data set and so much data, a lot of traditional methods just simply would be too slow and just wouldn't work for our data. So we had to develop what I call our own engine for Atlas. So what we do is grid each point cloud, which a point cloud is just what's the return from Atlas, which is a three-dimensional um, set of points with X, Y, Z coordinates and their own attributes. And when we zoom into a 100 meter grid cell, and you can see here, this is time one, we then subgrid it to two meter grids. And then we put in time two. And since we know from just prior knowledge that Helheim moves at about one meter per hour, this gives us some information about how to define our search radius. So we just increase our search radius by a little over a meter per hour. We then have to um, grid, we, we then have to categorize each subgrid with points in them. And then when each subgrid um, has a connecting points, we call that a shape. And then it searches within that um, little over a meter per hour search radius to find a shape of a similar size. And then when it finds the closest match, it corresponds with a corresponding feature tracked. And that is much faster than previous methods because we can run it even on a single computer core about you know within five minutes. Um, and then 
what we produce are um, digital elevation models from the point clouds, um, the surface velocities, X, Y, Z components from the, um, the Atlas engine that I just described, and also corresponding string rates. And what this figure on the left just shows is that each feature tracked from the um, Atlas engine with um, Helheim's term as position in 2020. So, and this is a, a relatively smaller scan. So you can see by the number of arrows that there's just lots of features to be tracked within these grid cells. So now we have, um, you know, our data being able to process and usable, not for myself, but also for the glaciological community. Um, now I can start actually doing the science. And one of the main driving questions for my PhD is uh, uh, what timescales does calving impact velocity? And this is a large calving event a Helheim Glacier captured um, in 2022. And on the right, we have um, a NASA, it's live velocity from 1985 to 2022, right? Because there's actually a lot of data available for the public to use. And Atlas, you know, can't compare to such a long record like NASA's it's live, but we can actually hone in to look at individual um, velocity responses to calving events. So one, yeah, you want to look at the timescales of um, variability relationship to calving, and also how does termis position relate to velocity? And just generally, maybe less specific, just how important is calving? And what we're looking at here is um, a two meter Arctic DEM, which is a, a DEM derived from high resolution optical imagery. And if you notice right in the center, we start seeing these lines. And what these lines are, are um, what we call flexure zones, which are large surface depressions that form on Helheim Glacier. And it's actually the common calving style. And what I mean by calving style is just how the glacier breaks off, because sometimes it can rotate backwards when it breaks off, sometimes it could topple forward um, and things like that. Um, but for Helheim specifically, these large flexures are pretty unique. We don't see them often at other glaciers, at least the surface expression of these large of these flexures themselves. Um, so um, many glaciologists have come before me, they've um, you know, observed um, this type of calving, buoyant flexure calving, and um, Tavy Murray's paper in 2015, they developed their own um, conceptual model of how a flexure would form. And what they argue, well, well, what they argue, what they explain is that the glacier, since it's moving so fast at a meter per hour, which is roughly you know, 24 meters per day, and Helheim can reach up to over 30 meters per day at the terminus, that this rapid glacier flow pushes the glacier into deeper water shown in this um, panel A here. And because ice is um, less dense than water, it um, has to readjust its buoyancy. So it then lifts up. And this lifting mechanism causes what's called a basal crevasse, so a giant crevasse at the bottom of the glacier. And eventually it continues to grow and it rotates back and knocks the calving, um, the new terminus. And um, oftentimes these large flexors like a D and D prime here form into a large surface, which, which we just saw on the previous um, DEM. Um, and what they um, say from this theory is that flexors much follow the grounding line. So that transition between grounding to floating ice and also that origin point um, shouldn't be fixed in space then. It can just happen almost anywhere near the terminus. And this data is based off of a 19 GNSS node, so like GPS on the ice that lasted for 55 days. And what I'm about to show you here is a video of um, um, Atlas, um, Atlas detected flexures. And these brownish red dots here is the terminus, which doesn't match with the Sentinel-1 image, the SAR image in the background, but this is just the images just from a similar time period of these. And then the, the dots behind the terminus are those actual depressions, those flexures forming. So I want you all to focus on where they form because that's really important and what Atlas is good at finding. And you can just see the terminus is advancing and it'll eventually retreat after the calving event and it will most likely calve back to that previous flexure. And if you see, they keep on forming like in this small area here which is already making me suspicious about the previous um, conceptual model. So looking back at this DM that y'all have already seen, we can now plot where all the um, flexures originated from 2015 to 2023 during the um, Atlas catalog. So again, that's already straying away from the current um, conceptual model from Murray et al. And 
to think about why are they occurring there? What changes are these flexures um, seeing over time? And this bar graph on the left shows um, the max observed flexure count. So how many flexures can exist at one given time? And this is from Arctic DM, those optically derived um, digital elevation models, and also the Atlas the DMs as well. And we do see some slight increase starting um, after, after 2018. There are some outliers um, here as well, but generally speaking, we do start seeing more flexures um, on the surface at a given time. And thinking back at the question, why are they forming in that spot and why are they changing so much? Um, well, with Atlas, we can do pretty high repeat rate um, DM differencing. And this uh, map on the left shows the um, 2016 to 2023 DM difference. And it's pretty much all red, right? And, which means that it's thinning a lot. And at most, at near the margins, at up to 80 meters within that time frame. So that's a lot of mass loss happening at the margins, which Atlas captured. And you can see on the right, which is just the time series of this profile A to A prime here, that a lot of mass loss, right, on these south and north margin, and slightly less in the in the center. And I can explain more of why we see this uh, signal in the future, or in the future slides. Um, so with Atlas, right, we can get thinning. But we could also, what I believe is its strongest strength is um, that's able to capture the vertical velocity. So that, or the vertical displacement, that, that Z component that a lot of um, other data sets miss. So on this map on the left is the vertical displacement at a given time from um, specifically this time here. And the red means it's moving down slope or just downwards. And the blue means it's moving upwards. And this yellow line here, is the terminus. And then this yellow dot is just the intersection between the profile and the terminus line. And this helps us orientate with the profile on the right here where that yellow dot's the terminus. And this is just distance along the profile and the vertical displacement. And then we can see that it's actually just moving up and down. And beyond the terminus is just that melange, that floating sea ice and iceberg. So we can notice that the behind the terminus is also floating as well. And we can do this over all of Atlas North. And I would say, I should have said this before, that Atlas North only works when it was in 2018, 2019, and some of 2022 and 2023. Um, and we can only use the vertical displacement for Atlas North because it's at a higher vantage point. That gives us better point on densities per grid cell. So that's, that's a kind of unfortunate, but we still get amazing results here. And we can actually map the grounding line at Helheim. And, this map on the right shows that the minimum grounding line, so the most upflow in purple from 2018 here, and then the, the most retreated in 2018, which is behind it also in purple. And then as we start warming in colors, we see that in 2019, it's stayed the same at the end of 2018, but then it retreated a lot back in 2019. And there's this little gap here, which I'm suspicious that this is just following the subglacial channel, because you can see some water-filled crevasses here that always form at Helheim. And I believe that there's a subglacial channel right below here that exits here. So it's really hard to determine the grounding line in that position. But regardless, we can with average the grounding line positions um, over time. So just get like the average position in space, which is what the scatter plot on the right shows that we have the X position here on the X and then time on the Y. So it's a little different than traditional time series, but I think it highlights that, that retreat more because if you move back left on this X and you move up in time, that's just showing how much the grounding line has retreated. And it's retreated about, you know, more than like three kilometers just within a year time span. And I should be careful when I say grounding line because it's not always just consistently moving back and forth, like moving consistently back. It's more like just swaying back and forth with the tides as well. So within these spaces here, you can consider that more of the grounding zone. So we're seeing a grounding zone retreat. Um, and then, I'm trying to think of a reason why we see the flexures um, in a consistent two kilometer square spot. And also, um, you know, how does that relate to the thinning? And then a recent paper from Jan et al. in 2024, they just um, um, explained that they, from their seism seism seismic data, from the seismometers they have from like hell one through hell four here, they all point towards the subglacial ridge, which is the bed here and here. And this ridge here, that is where the seismometers point to, is where a lot of them tremor and the tremors associated with subglacial slip. So possibly that it's not 
the terminus being driven below flotation, acting like some diving board um, bending back up, but maybe there's some subglacial slip happening where that flexure is occurring, where those flexure spots are originating that's causing a basal crevasse. So slightly, so pretty different from the current um, conceptual model. And to maybe explain this more, we have to use the force, right? So the, what we have to do is um, do what's called a force balance, which, <laughs> which um, we just look at the driving stress, which is rho gh, so the gravity times the thickness times the density of ice times the slope has to be balanced by the basal drag, um, the lateral, the longitudinal stress, so the stretching or compression, and also the lateral drag at the margins, which is a um, little schematic shows us here. And we right now I'm doing this with the Arctic DM and um, NASA's its live, so not with Atlas right now, but from the map on the left we can see the flexure origination points and also the red and blue um, patches. And the, the blue patches means it's um, compressing and the red means it's stretching. So this is in 2016 here. And if we look at it in 2021, that all becomes red, which means it's all stretching. And if we look at this time series of the profiles here, we see that where this um, gray bar is, is the projection of the flexure points. And that, that transition from compression to stretching and now driving stretch just bursts onto the scene, right? And then we can see that this stretching is compensated by um, a reduction in driving stress. Um, and I can't really explain what's causing what right now with the current data I'm using, but I'm currently working on producing um, the force balance data with all of the Atlas catalog. So this will give us a better um, idea of the timing for the stretching and the reduction in driving stress to so hopefully find a causation with what's happening at that specific spot in the bed. So now we have a different explanation of why flexures occur. Um, how important is calving with velocity? And I know a lot of um, scientists really want to know, you know, what, what, what controls termis position. And this is Atlas velocity in the top plot on the left. And then on the bottom is termis position, where if it's a smaller number, it's more advanced. And if it's larger, it's more retreated. And this is simply looking at it, we can see that when a glacier speeds up, it's more retreated. And if it's um, slowing down, it's more advanced. And each bar here represents um, the style of calving. So a Fletcher style in red and the green, which is the non-Fletcher style. And going back to my original question of, you know, how does um, calving, what, what calving, well, the velocity response to calving events, I my initial hypothesis would have been this, what Nettles et al. produced in 2008 with on ice GNSS, and they see a stepwise change in calving over time. And this is just the area loss and also the water level differences after calving events. So a strength of Atlas is that we can actually sample anywhere we want um, with a velocity product. And this is just a point cloud in the sampling cube I use that I calculate from behind the center of the calving blocks mass. And you can see that the Helheim just calved here. And this on the right is just the velocity time series around a calving event, so in days on the X, and also the speed in meters per day on the Y. And we don't see much change at all around calving events, but we don't see that stepwise change often, but sometimes we do here, but it's often really short lived, only for you know less than a day, a few hours at most. And we can average this all out at what I call a, a, a flexure calving signature, or just a calving signature. And how to read this figure is that the bold black line is the the average velocity response per calving style with the faded gray lines responding corresponding to individual calving events. And this is for flexure style and non-flexure style. And we even sometimes see a stepwise decrease in calving, which most likely just relates to how we're sampling because after you move the sampling point back, it's just retreated upflow into a slightly more grounded and thicker ice. But we don't see that stepwise change much at all, which is similar to what has been published at Cermat Kujilek, which is a giant West Greenlandic glacier. Um, but they don't, um, Ryan Casoto, they use similar methods to Atlas, not laser scanners, but terrestrial radar interferometry to look at very short time scale responses to calving. And they only see a few calving events that actually have an increase, most do not. And there's really no um, uh, correlation with the size of the calving and the change in speed at all. So I guess that's reassuring that no, not all calving events will create, or if any calving events, really a strong or consistent response to velocity. 
So my main takeaways for this part is just that flexures form over a consistent spot and might be associated with subglacial slip. And it's just different than what was previously um, um, written. Um, if we have dramatic thinning in grounding line retreat at Helheim, and there is really no influence on velocity from calving in the Atlas record. And calving style doesn't seem to be taken, seem to have any effect on the velocity either. So that can be kind of discouraging for me. At first, I was like, man, I wanted like, you know, some like Fletcher style calving is like really important. And it's, we saw a big spike in velocity, but that didn't happen. So I was like thinking about it more. And now y'all have seen this DM several times now. So right, the Fletcher ordination here, is there a Fletcher? So I was like, what? What what can Kazan style tell us? And you know, I'm looking at all these images of Helheim all the time, and I start to see these like bands of icebergs in the melange. And what these bands of icebergs um, represent are um, previous um, Fletcher style calving events. And what I my started hypothesizing is that um, these large icebergs that just calved off from Helheim might be, you know soaking up a lot of heat from the warm Atlantic waters at the bottom of the fjord before that heat could be used to melt the, the terminus. So to test this hypothesis as a melange as a heat sink, uh, really how much Atlantic water reaches the terminus, we have to parameterize our variables. So in the schematic, again, we see the warm Atlantic waters at the bottom and it's warm at the bottom because it's salty and dense than the fresh polar water at the top. And we just integrate over a specific gate, the amount of heat coming in flow to the fjord. And then also the iceberg heat flux, which is just integration of the melt rate over um, an iceberg. And these are just in units of watts, so like joules over time. And this schematic, I want to be real with y'all, right? It's, this is a beautiful schematic, but um, in reality, it's not like I-35 of heat just hitting the terminus, right? It's really more sloshing back and forth we see um, this velocity here in red and blue. And this is from, if you can see it here, from a mooring in Sermilic Fjord where Helheim discharges into. So it's really more sloshing back and forth. I mean, yes, there's warm water reaching the terminus, but it's just not like a beautiful little stream of current. It's, it's a little more sloshy back and forth, just, just, just how reality and data is. Um, and I wanna explain for the non-glaciologist that the typical glaciological perspective of a melange is thought of as a buttressing force, so like a mechanical deterrent that, you know, impedes calving um, on glaciers. And I'm currently, um, in this paper, I'm currently co-author and review, and what Olivia does is a great job of correlating melange thickness with, um, with um, termis advancement and then um, termis retreat with a thin melange. And this is just, you know, correlation. Again, we can't really speak on the causation and we also developed a new parameterization to quantify melange buttressing in models, which, I mean, as Michaela would know that model and parameterizations are very important. And so not from the glaciological perspective, but big icebergs and a melange can also modify the subglacial plume height or what's called the neutral buoyancy depth of subglacial plumes. And you can see here on the left from Congento et al. 2023 that if there are small icebergs, that undercutting from that subglacial discharge um, is really high. But if you have bigger icebergs, right, it modifies that, that undercut it to be much smaller. And it also, the, some of that subglacial water can remain in the, in the fjord because of this, the terminal moraine or sill height. And I want to shout out to Michaela because um, sedimentation processes like this uh, moraine building are really important. And I know that's what her PhD is mainly focusing on. So, how do I actually quantify melange as a heat sink? Well, I get some help from AI, specifically Meta's new segment anything model. And what we have here are two Sentinel-2 images with um, iceberg segmentation results in the um, colored iceberg outlines here. And the colors represent the keel depth because I integrate the SAM result with um, an iceberg melt model. And then uh, this little bar plot on the right just explains the iceberg length and, and the excuse me, the frequency of iceberg lengths within the um, segmentation results. And if it's shaded, it just means that it intersects with that deep Atlantic water. So by integrating um, the iceberg segmentation results with SAM, we can actually get some estimate of ice volume within a melange. And these are what the iceberg geometries look like. If it's longer than about 400 meters on the surface, then we just force it to a cube because this is from um, a Barker et al. model from 2004, 
and from their data set of icebergs gains, they didn't have much more um, data than the 400 meter long icebergs that we just have to force into the cubes. And luckily I know some oceanographers who can run um, numerical models much better than myself. And they, you know, my friend Ken, he was at Oregon State. He provides me with um, a three-year average fjord velocity here, which is that parameter U in our, um, our Atlantic warm water heat flux equation. It also gives me an average temperature and it gives me the average um, warm Atlantic water heat flux here. And then from NASA's ocean smelting Greenland conductivity temperature depth on NASA OMG for short, this is just an example of how um, stratified that fjord water is because you have temperature on the X depth of the Y and you see right here in this transition boundary is where that warm Atlantic water exists. And because it's really hard to actually get real data for um, fjord velocity, this U parameter, I just use um, varied, various um, fixed velocities based off of Ken's um, output results here. And what this is, y'all, is a, um, a waffle plot. And a waffle plot just is a different way than to show proportions than, like, say, a pie, pie chart. I don't know why it's all food, but that's just how it is. Um, and each block represents about 10 gigawatts which relates to about a cubic kilometer per year of ice melt. So that's that's a big chunk of ice that could be melted from these warm Atlantic waters. And I should say, if there's any physical oceanographers in here, that this is all this heat is not going towards the glacier, right? But that's just like the heat reservoir in each fjord system. And from the lower bound results, we see about you know 20 to 10 gigawatts of heat is taken up by icebergs. But this is from a very low estimate that's from previous parameterizations of iceberg melt that are based off of ice shelves, which is a completely different environment than what like a vertical ice berg would face. But luckily there are some really great scientists out there who have observed submarine melt on vertical ice faces. And they said that it's actually about a four times increase in the heat and sand salt transfer coefficients. So whatever that the previous methods were actually multiply it by four and that's actually way more realistic. And when we use the more realistic um, the transfer coefficients, we get about a 28% of the heat in Helheim fjords taken up by these deep icebergs and 21% at the other glacier we studied, which is a King of Sirtuak fjord. And here we have, because of our methods of using SAM with the iceberg melt model, we can actually view the parameter space of iceberg heat flux. And we don't know like the, all of the red blocks here, but this is pretty much showing us all those blue blocks. And this is for Helheim fjord in blue, um, Kanger Sutwak in orange, red is uh, Sermet Kujilek in West Greenland, and then Apernovik Fjord in um, West Greenland as well. And we can see that the ice volume actually varies a lot. And, and this is using a fixed velocity at um, 0.35 centimeters per second, right? So in reality, I believe they exist more in boxes, right? Because the velocity, I mean, the iceberg volumes change over time, and so does the um, the temperatures. So what I'm currently doing, which if I gave this talk next week, I'll probably have these boxes, was to show that, you know, there's actually a lot of variability within the ice volume that I think is actually more variable than the Atlantic warm water heat flux. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that this QIB value, iceberg heat flux, actually varies a lot per fjord, and each melange exists really on a spectrum. You can't really just say all the melange are really the same. And so that's my melange conclusions, um, mainly that there's about 28% reduction at most from icebergs um, from a warm Atlantic waters. Um, calving style um, influences the iceberg size distribution and therefore actually relates to submarine melt. So maybe calving style is actually a bit more important than what I originally thought. Um, yeah, like what I just said before, ice volume can vary substantially. And we, I think as a glaciology community should go beyond melange as a buttressing force because it can modify the, um, the plume heights as well as the warm Atlantic waters coming in. And for future work, um, I need to continue developing and testing point cloud algorithms um, to make better data for the community, um, develop more robust error analysis for Atlas, um, apply the force balance analysis to Atlas, like what I explained earlier, and it's very soon to be done. Um, again, use like SAM on image stacks to get a launch time series and just make the data I produce as open and as available as possible in cloud optimized formats. And uh, for my acknowledgments, I obviously want to thank my advisor, Lee Stearns and co-advisor uh, CJ Vanderveen. They've really helped me a lot, changing me from a 
little awkward glaciologist to someone that hopefully can explain and understanding. Um, as all my collaborators, Adam, Dave, Howard, Ken, Aurora, and Fiamo, thank you so much. And my amazing lab partner, Melise Lummis, for, you know, instilling confidence in me and, you know, just making me feel comfortable doing something like this. And I'll leave y'all with this picture here and you can contact me. I guess this is me resisting Elon Musk. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, if y'all have any questions, I would love to answer them. And note that a polar bear actually ate my PhD. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That was awesome. Um, I know I have questions, but I'm gonna let y'all. Should yeah, I stop first. sharing my screen? I'd say keep sharing. Okay. Also, if anyone online, anyone online has any questions too, go ahead and unmute. I can start us off with a question. Oh. Yeah, Kevin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> jump ahead. Uh, so I'm curious, because you had some comparisons with other glaciers. I'm curious um, with what you know about the melange process in, for Helheim, like how close to an idolized glacier is Helheim versus what about Helheim do you think is unique with its like geometry and everything? Hmm. That's a good question. I think one, I think this might be a good figure to explain because this is Kanger Sertwak, also known as Kanger Leswek. Um, Helheim is just so, so straight, right? It just literally just flows in the X direction. And so for the fjord geometry, I think that um, might help a lot in changing it uh, compared to I mean, more of a windy fjord like uh, in Kanger Sertwak. Um, also, if we talk about the bed geometry right there's just that ridge in the middle of it and from bed machine right we know that like you no know, bed machine near the terminus can be you know quite hit or miss but we do know that that bed ridge exists we just don't really know how like wide right so i think that makes it different than other glaciers um and for in the melange it's it's also not as long as like cermex right it's it's about you know cermex is just so big but I think if we go here, we can see that the ice volume actually, even though Cermex is so large, it actually has, but from this is just from a single time shot, but like it actually has a less ice volume, or estimated ice volume than Helheim. And I think that's because it just has smaller icebergs because it's mostly grounded compared to Helheim where we see it like floating a lot, which I believe increases that iceberg size. So I hope that answers your question, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. I have a question, Michael. Who is this, Michaela? Yeah, it's me. King. Um, so you have all this Atlas data, like millions of points. And yeah. I've noticed that like you're looking at changes happening with your flexure zones areas um, mm -hmm. and like seeing the grounding line change. I was wondering if you thought of like any hypotheses or questions to test to see what's going on at the bed. I mean, you did mention like mm -hmm. machine is kind of like a shot in the dark there, but I was wondering if you think this method that you use can improve any of those kind of like subglacial geometry things going on. That's a, a great question, Michaela, right? And I think that's kind of what I try to get at here a bit with using the force balance, right? To see how that forces change over time. Because with, I'm, re I'm actually not using Atlas for this. I'm using Arctic DEM and um, it's live. But we can see that, um, hold on, let me do this fancy thing. Right, we do see that like stretching is changing, which is probably related to something at the bed. So with Atlas, I believe that we can maybe, you know, think about it with a lot more lines, like thousands of more lines. We can maybe see the timing better at these processes. Um, and also specifically at the bed, we, we can also kind of note here, like I explained briefly is, um, this grounding line here that was from the end of 2019's Atlas North, that it does get really wonky near where these um, water-filled crevasses are. Oh, we can't see my screen. Oh, whoops. There here. You um, we can't see here where the um, these water-filled crevasses are. So I think that will relate to the bed because like a lot of times we can, I don't have it here, but we can see like the grounding lines just oscillate back and forth quite far and I think that would um highlight trapped water and also like where it gets just 
a little wonkier. We see, you know, these like, you know, hydrologic features like water filled crevasses. So I think with Atlas's grounding line, right, you could, you know, kind of infer some sort of like hydrologic, subglacial hydrologic process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead, Jenny. Jenny, you have a question? I'm trying to figure out my Zoom. Um... I am curious about you. You mentioned something about like the calving style not mattering. And I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit more, like what, in what context do you think it doesn't matter? I think it might not matter as much as far as a velocity response goes. Cause I'm not sure if we see, because from Atlas, we don't really see a strong velocity response at all after a Fletcher style calving event where we see those large surface depressions. And where it versus a non-flexure style calving event where those large surface depressions don't exist. So I'm not sure if like you know, the calving style really matters as far as the velocity goes, but for like an individual calving event. But you know, if you average it over time, maybe that you know the general process of why that calving style exists probably relates more to the ice dynamics than like an individual event itself. Okay. That's what I thought. But um, yeah. yeah, I thought you were kind of saying more globally the style of calving. No. I was like, what? No. <laughs> no. Um, and then I, I, I want you to look at like, I'm curious about if you've thought about this terminus driven model approach that mm -hmm. Ian Jockin wrote about and Ian Howard. Yeah. And um, if you've employed that with the Atlas data wow. in addition to the force balance to try to get at like what's specifically happening at the terminus. And what we found with that is really useful is that it allowed us to kind of decompose the velocity signals a little more um, mm -hmm. discreetly so that we could yeah. identify different processes that might be contributing to the velocities uh, at different times, especially with like really high temporal yeah. data. Um, so I guess my short answer is no, I have not applied that model, but I will definitely keep this in my brain. And <laughs> well, I can I can probably send you Enza's code on it mm -hmm. if you're interested. I don't know how to apply it to like such a okay. giant data set as yours, but mm -hmm. like how many DEMs do you have in a in a year? Um, in a, it really depends. Um, I don't have, like if we look here, we have it gets pretty sporadic. Um, mm -hmm. in like the earlier Atlas records, right? We have like two months in 2015, about like four or five months in 2016. And it's not really until. 2019 until now we get like consistent year-round coverage but in total that's about like yeah you know, we have about 42,000 I mean 4,200 scans right yeah and they're not all like and I might have lied a little bit just because I want to show off to my friends right because <laughs> they're they don't always they don't always look as good as this right yeah. like, you know I, I didn't lie too much because I showed kind of bad ones here but you know you kind of want to just look good on camera but like, yeah, they're not always if you've evaluated the quality of your, of like mm -hmm. PGC DEMs with like your scans, if you've done any kind of check to see how good the PGC DEMs are based on the scans that you're making, assuming um, your scans are like true. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's right. Cause I think they're both kind of not, they both have their flaws. Right. Um, and I, I don't have a figure with it, but I do like, you can see with Atlas and PGC and also Arc and also ISAT too. Because ISAT 2 might be actually, we do get overlaps with ISAT 2, which shows that Atlas point clouds and ISAT 2 actually, like, you know, are pretty well aligned without even okay. co registering. So I think that might help with that. And I do have some general, like, small data error analysis with Atlas products. It's a little easier with just the point clouds because you're just looking at a set of points in a grid for a DEM. So if you just have more points in a grid cell, you have a better quality. DEM because you just have more knowledge yeah but, um, but with um the velocities it gets way trickier and that's kind of the, one of the last steps I just need to do which I actually manually tracked like I just looked into like features like this right and it was like okay if this block here or this ice or serac here is you know moving to matching this one what's that distance and then it came out to about r squared about like 0.89 so it wasn't like too bad mm -hmm. with the velocity products Probably a little more than what you asked for, Jenny, but. No, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. It's a great talk. Thank you. Questions in the room? I didn't see you. A lot of people in here now. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I'm curious if you've tried to like decompose for a tidal signal in your atlas data. I, I might need. I should prepare this. Um, we do <laughs> see what, what. Um, I can. I don't want to go into my. Y'all can see my Google Chrome. I have some um slides here. Um, that I'm, somehow miraculously with Atlas data, we um we do see um w what happens is that so Helheim is a semi diurnal tide cycle. So there's four um there's four peak tides. There's two high tides, two low tides each day with a tidal range of about three meters. And somehow with Atlas, when it scans every six hours, so that's four times a day, it actually matches pretty well with each um, high and low tide. And I'm not, I mean, maybe Lee, Lee's here. So maybe Lee can explain. If she was there when they were installed. Maybe they thought about that. I'm not sure if it was just, um, just sheer luck or something. <laughs> I missed the first part of the question. It was, was how... Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. It was like my kid was asking about the tides, and I would say how Atlas somehow we miraculously timed it pretty well with the high and low tides. And I'm not sure if that was like intentional or if that was just like slightly sheer luck. A little bit of see. both. We did have a tidal model when we first put it out, but I think each year okay. we go back, we kind of adjust the timing a bit. So I think it's just we started out being intentional about it, and I think it's drifted a little bit um, from yeah. what we, I mean, because we first installed it in like 20. 15 or something yeah um and then every time we go back and fix things the timing skews a little bit oh my god i couldn't find those tidal figures but um well we can actually see here um i know i left um, a velocity signal when we talk about the um um let me just do this on yeah and these like tides like you could kind of see here right on this one that these are velocities but it just bobs up and down with the tide so when it when it's actually a little faster it's high tide just because there's less water as to push through versus when it's low tide there's just simply less water to push through so yeah you know what I mean? very cool but, well we need to chat because i'm still curious about bed evolution yeah. stuff mm -hmm. and um, yeah Maybe I sold myself short here too, because right, there's really no great data set of grounding lines for like glaciers like Helheim, right? We see them for floating ice tongues in Greenland like Peterman, but this, I think these might be the first like true grounding line positions of Helheim. Yeah, because I would think that the like, I guess that the topography peak you were talking about would at least change a little bit over this time, mm -hmm. especially for possible glacier. Totally. So um, yeah, I'd be curious. Yeah, and I'd also know there's some, I mean, from conversation with Fiamma, thinking about the sedimentation, just changes in the bed. Like, I know when she pulls out her moorings, like she just like says like it's so much muck, like mud, just like coming up with these moorings. So I don't know yeah. what the sedimentation rate is, but and then from Matthew's recent field work in Greenland at Helheim, they did this um like this like kind of like an ice fin thing, but not exactly ice fin, like you know like a UAV. And they mm. said it was just completely flat, like the 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 bathymetry, but also it's probably just completely sediment. So I don't know how much is sediment filled or not, right? So the effective bed for the glacier will just push through that sediment, right? So I don't yeah. know how deep really or what that signal would look like. QTNA. Mm -hmm. Well, if no one else has any questions. <laughs> Uh, let's thank Michael one more time. And if you have any postdoc opportunities for him. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks y'all for joining. Yeah, thank you everyone. Bye, Michael. Bye.